This is the Lean Builders Hoots on the Ground podcast with absolutely, positively no bullshito. Join us as we dig into exactly what lean construction is and how we can use these concepts and strategies in the field. This podcast will be different as we journey to job sites and mine the minds of lean builders, all in effort to pass forward building knowledge from those who have put their time in to learn a better way. Because that's just what lean builders do. What's up, y'all? Adam Hoots here, the lean builder. Hoots on the ground with no bullshito. And today I got Mr. Construction Yeti himself, Matt Graves. Say what's up to the people, man. What's up, Boots? How you doing, man? Hope everyone man. out there is doing, having a good day. Yeah, I am doing well. Coming down with a little sickness or something, but nothing we can't shake and have a little fun today. First, thank you for being on the podcast, man. I'm so excited because as soon as we issue this one, I'm going to get like 18 million followers <laughs> to the Lean Builder folks. So. We are very appreciative of that. No, but in all seriousness, man, like you have just come on out of nowhere and taken like social media by storm. So I'm super excited to dive into the how, the why, the way, like all of that stuff. Before we do that, man, I just want to get to know you a little better. I want the listeners to better understand who you are. Can you take us down that road? Who are you? What are you passionate about? What gets you going, man? Yeah, I hope you catch a few followers off of all of this. I've got a few on social media. No, it'll be fun. And I about halfway thought you were going to surprise me like I surprised you when you came on our podcast and just made it a, a LinkedIn live stream at the last minute. And I can hit the live button. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I stood you up the last time whenever I didn't show up on the call. It was a trick. Anyways, I'm Matt Graves. I'm a construction guy, project manager by trade. I went to Texas A&M, did civil engineering as my bachelor's. And I got halfway through engineering school and I was like, screw this, man. I don't want to be an engineer. And so the last year you could tailor it towards structures or geotech or the specialties. And I uh, specialized in construction project management, which you don't really know how to be a project manager when it's, when it's all said and done. I got out, I got to my first job and on the, as a subcontractor. And I remember them saying like, all right, we need you to put together the middle. Can you put together the middle? And I was like, I don't even know what that means. Oh, okay. Can you write an RFI? And I was like, a, a what? I don't, yeah. So just had no understanding of construction and construction management really. And so I really learned everything by Googling stuff, by watching YouTubes. My mentor, it was a real small company. There was like four or five of us in the office and like my quote mentor, when you're a small company like that, everyone's hair's on fire. I didn't really have good mentorship. And so a lot of failing or a lot of writing bad emails, nasty emails, <laughs> learned a lot of what to do by doing stuff wrong. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. yeah. So I worked for a couple, couple subcontractors doing that. Now I work for an owner's rep firm and came over to this side. And again, I was Googling stuff all the time. Cause it's just, you know, seeing stuff by a different, seeing the project through a different side and different lens. So I realized once you get above like the entry level 101 type of stuff, Google, you, you run out of stuff. You know what I mean? It's like, you almost got to experience it more and you need to have like real experiences. And I found like a lot of times you, you wind up on a, some contractor's website and you realize you're reading some blog article and you're like, man, whoever wrote this has no idea what they're talking about. They just wrote this article for SEO. And so they wind up on the top of Google, but they, it's a marketing person. You don't know the industry. So I had a, an idea. I'm going to start the construction Yeti blog. This was back in January, 2020. And the idea was I'm going to put out these articles and it's going to be by a construction guy for construction people, right? So I'm actually. Hopefully knows what I'm talking about because I'm in the industry, not just a marketing person. And so I launched it in January, 2020, COVID hit in March of 2020. And just with all the hecticness and everything else like that, I lost interest in it, but it sat there for a couple of years. So I was like, man, this is getting some traffic. I just it was getting some Google hits. It was up on, ah, I should relaunch this. And so June of 22, I relaunched it as a sub stack. It was like a weekly newsletter. And the idea was like. Same thing. I just want, I'm always Googling something. I'm curious about something. I'm learning something like nobody in this industry knows everything, every project you go to every day. Like I'm always learning something new, right? I hear something and I have to go Google it. What did they talk? What is this about? Acronyms. Oh my goodness. Dude, the acronyms are wild. So the first company I worked for, 
it was not only a construction company where I didn't even know what RFI meant, but it was a uh, federal contracting. We did a lot of DOD work. And not only are you learning construction acronyms, you're learning federal acronyms and everything they say is an acronym. And I was just like, my head was spinning. So anyway, so I relaunched it as a newsletter and then I, this free thing, I had to quote, sell it to, because I want to grow a subscriber base. So I turned to LinkedIn I started posting more on LinkedIn and more and more trying to no real vision in sight other than, Hey, I'm going to try to grow this newsletter thing up just as a game, as a fun thing. I want to get back to the industry. And once I get a million subscribers to it, I can put some ads on it and make a dollar. It was the very little thought out plan when I launched it. The one thing I didn't realize, maybe I was just naive. was like, it was going to lead me to meet so many awesome people in the industry, mm -hmm. basically through LinkedIn, through the newsletter, you start doing something like that. And People want to reach out to you and learn about what you're doing. You know, I met you, I met Jesse Hernandez and y'all's whole crew. And there's so many other people. I have phone calls with people every other day, just with people I've met through all this sort of stuff. That's anyway, that's the I don't know, five minute short story. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. And you said a lot of things that I want to dive into. So what's been the biggest surprise out of this newsletter, social media thing that you've been getting into? The Biggest surprise is probably just the people I've met, the opportunities that have come my way. Just I built a mm -hmm. network where I feel like if I have a question about anything, if I can't figure it out, I have somebody I can call on in my network and it's a virtual network because it's been built on the back of LinkedIn and stuff like that and the newsletter. But I've just met so many awesome people when it comes to that, <clears throat> and that just the networking behind it. A lot of people get on there for purely wanting to business development, get leads sell product, whatever it is. And if you actually go into it with wanting to meet people and network with people, like it's a really good opportunity. Yeah. So I hear you starting to go down the road of maybe advice for somebody that wants to do something. Maybe they want to do a podcast or another newsletter. Like where would you tell them to begin? What's the starting point? Find somebody who's gone down that path mm -hmm. and just pick their brain. I've been able to do that with people and like people are super receptive of it. I think people in the construction industry, especially people that are doing all these little side projects like you're doing and I'm doing, and there's a lot of people creating content. I've never met somebody who wasn't open and willing and eager to help. So just even if it's a 30 minute, 45 minute, an hour call, just to ask them what they're doing, how they're doing. I've given people my entire quote playbook of exactly, all right, this is what I've done. This is what I've done. This is what I've done. And I'll be honest with them. And I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm just figuring it out as I go. And this is what's working for me. I'm a, one of my pet peeves with the industry is all these contractors and all these companies, they act like the way they do things is a secret sauce. It's an industry secret. And that's the, yes, all you're doing is holding back the industry and you're holding back the next generation. Everyone's doing things generally the same way, but just by not collaborating, you're holding everything back. So I'd feel like a real hypocrite if I didn't share what I'm doing pretty openly. Yeah. I love the point you're making. And I ran into this trap when I was first, so I was leaving my first company and I was like, man, these projects are just a lot. I'm working a lot of hours. I'm not like all weekend. I don't get to see my family. I got to do something different. And I was 14 years into a big time GC, hundred year old company. I was like, Ooh, there's this other shiny company from the nineties. They're lean. They do things better. And I went over there and it was even worse than the first company. And I was like, holy cow. And I started to realize that, yeah, it's an industry thing, right? There is no secret sauce anywhere except mm -hmm. for the individuals who are on the project and really how they treat people. I think that's the secret sauce. And so you can get a company of a bunch of people who care about people. Things are just going to run more smooth. Well, that's hundred percent what I've seen as well. Yeah, it's, it's getting, it's going to be more and more important in the coming decade. I don't have to say the stats. Everyone heard of the stats. I don't even know what the stats are. A billion people are going to retire from the industry in the next 10 years, yeah. whatever the crazy numbers are. They, they say between seven and 10 people are going to die or retire to one entering the trades. That tells you all you need to know right now is that we're about to have it. It's already tough, but we're about to have a huge labor crunch. And if you're not people first, you're not caring for the people. I think, and I'm just a dumb construction guy who likes to write online, but there's about to be a huge shift in the top construction companies out there. I think some of these big names, which have been running the industry for the last decades, 20, 30, 40, 50 decades, if they don't adapt to that people first mentality, 
they're going to get left behind and people are going to go to the companies that are taking care of people, are putting the people first, are implementing tools and um, technology that really makes their life better and doesn't squeeze every last drop of productivity out of them. Yeah. You, so you mentioned a couple of things. One, you went from R, not knowing what an RFI or SAMU is to now you're running projects from an ownership perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I would love for you to just take us down that journey. I didn't know anything. I Googled the heck out of it, YouTube university, and now where you're sitting now and yeah, maybe how people played into that role. Yes. That's basically the short story of when you graduated college. And I've seen it with people who actually have specialized construction management degrees. They come into the industry and they may know what an RFI means, but they don't really know the application. They don't really know the nuances. The, there's a lot more art to this stuff than there is a pure science, right? You can write a question that says, you're missing a detail. Please give me the detail. Yeah. But okay, there's a lot kind of more to it than that. But I've, looking back on my career, I've, people have asked me, who's your mentor? I don't have a mentor. What I have is I, I take little bits and pieces from a lot of different people. I haven't had like a mentor. I've had little bits and pieces from a lot of different people and I've made myself with, as I've learned, and a lot of it is you see somebody do something. I've learned more about what to do right by watching people do stuff wrong. There's a whole bunch of people out there doing stuff wrong, screaming, yelling, writing crappy emails, threatening, just not really taking care of the people. So I, I've sit there and observed that I didn't play out very well. Let's not do that. So it's just been that journey. And then everywhere I've been at three companies now through my career and every step along the way, it's the, it's the same thing, but it's, you're selling or looking at a widget in a different direction. So then just coming into it, not afraid to mess up, taking a chance because there's too many people get in the industry and they just, they freeze up because they just don't know what to do. They don't want to mess it up. The industry moves too fast. The, a project moves too fast for you to sit there and sit on your hands and just afraid you screw up. You got to make a decision and move on. And if you made the wrong decision, fix it, say you're sorry and move on. Too many people fail, not from making a mistake, but from inaction. Yeah. To, can you take us down the road of maybe one of the mistakes that you've made that has a, a biggest learning for you? Yeah, you know, we can leave company is it all that good stuff out of it. Honestly, probably a lot of it was. I was working under some people who were very aggressive and very, it's the same story again, of just, this is one reason why I like, man, you gotta be people first. You gotta take care of the people. You gotta just be collaborative. I was, I'd be firing off nasty emails at 10 o'clock at night, super stressed and just threatening, referencing contracts and all that sort of stuff. And you realize like when you come into a very adversarial, you're going to be met very adversarial and things aren't, things will turn out nicely. You end up getting attorneys involved. You end up getting lawsuits involved. You end up having to go fly across the country to go to mediations. And that, there was a time when I was like, man, I'm going to be, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to law school. I spent half my day talking to attorneys. Obviously it was a company that was growing fast and burned out, but yeah, these attorneys, like they're billing $500 an hour and they're just listening to me telling them my problems. Right. And then they write, they don't even write it. They have their paralegal write some form letter with references case law and they bill $500 an hour for that. I was like, that's the gig I need, <laughs> but just not being collaborative, not trying to see it from the other side's point of view and just being adversarial. I learned real quick. You don't want to get the attorneys involved. Like the only people that are win when that happens are the attorneys. That was a lesson I learned very early in my career. It was painful, but it's shaped who I am today. Yeah. I love it. One of the things you, you could just said, and, and I'm training a puppy right now. Okay. And not that like people are like dogs by any means, but I've noticed when I treat this puppy like an animal, he acts like an animal. When I treat him like a person, acts like a person, like he's a respectable human being. It is the wild. I'll tell you, I get mad at him. He's a big dog. He's five months old, 65 pounds, English Mastiff. So he's going to be huge. And he has this thing where he likes to jump at people and bite. And it's, dude, you can't do that. You are just huge. And so I'll get mad at him and I'll like, no, you're a bad dog. And I'll take him and I'll put him out on the back deck. Immediately, he goes to the bathroom on the back deck. However, if I, like in the same scenario, if I'm like, listen, Bronco, this is me. You can't bite people. You are enormous. You have got to control yourself better than that. I need you to go out back and think about it. He will literally go out back, go right down the stairs, do his business. Like he knows what's going on. It is the wildest thing in the world. 
Uh, you're exactly right. The way we treat people is how they're going to react to our scenario. It goes, if you're a general contractor or something, right? The trades are suffering. There's not enough people. We've talked about that. And so if you treat your trades properly, they have two jobs to be at today. They can choose to be at your project and keep you on schedule, or they can go somewhere else. And I promise you, the people that treat them the right way and treat them and fairly, which side they're going to pick. They don't care about the ones screaming at them, if they're not getting paid and everything else, threatening every way they turn. So yeah, for ultra clarity, can you run us through what does that look like when you, when somebody is treating a trade good, what does that look like? Feel like smell tastes like being fair to them, paying them par- fairly. It's having a fair contract. It's not threatening with the contract. It's making sure you're calling them out. A lot of trades, especially if they're busy, if it's on the magnitude of the site, some trades, they may only be on your site for a few weeks. And if you call them out there before you're ready to come out there and to mobilize and they show up and you're not ready for them, they got to mobilize, demobilize. So just actually have being honest with them, being fair with them, making sure that things are ready for them when you call them out there. It's just really just treating them like a, I almost hate the, the term trade partner because it's almost become a buzzword, especially on LinkedIn. It, like people just say it almost because it's like synergy of 2002, right? Everybody said it and you're like, this is gross. Like I'm almost over this word. That's how I feel about respect for people. Yeah. <laughs> people just say it like without the true meaning behind it. It's like somebody said it, yeah. oh man, that's a really good thing to say. But if, but in all honesty, if you treat them like a partner on the team, then just treat them like you would treat anybody else. That's actually truly a partner, not a, not just somebody that's, you have to have on site, but actually, hey, we're all going to partner up on this together. One thing I've said probably a hundred times is not, no matter what, as an owner's rep, not, no matter what I do, no matter what a general contractor does, it lets herself perform me a ton of work. And no, like general contractors, not building the project. They have people running around to manage the project and manage the risk and make sure things are coordinated, but they're not swinging hammers. They're not pouring concrete. They're not actually building the project. Like you need those folks to build your project for you. And they're also they're the most important piece of the pie. So if, if you're not treating them properly, your everything's just going to be a mess. Yeah, I like that. And, and I, I'm surprised again. I travel the country. I go to a lot of job sites. I am oftentimes surprised by just the conditions that our people are operating in. Like you said, it's not fair, right? It's not being treated fair. They are a lot of times those trades contractors. They're looked at like a problem. The GC's got a problem. They've got, depending on the size and how quick things are moving, they could have 10 contractors, 20 contractors on site. So they have all these problems all over the place. They got to manage and make sure they're here or there. If you stop looking at them like a problem, look at them like an asset to the team, but actually give them, it blew my mind. I, I forget, I think it was the podcast we did with Felipe on our podcast where he was talking about bringing in nice restrooms. Hey, I have. That's not even a genius idea, but like, man, it's a genius idea because every project you go to, we're peeing in bottles and leaving them in walls because there's not a good bathroom. And I know I picked so many bottles up out of the attic and clips and core campus. <laughs> yeah, it's James McCadden, dude. We would be laying on our backs, crawling through the attic, hitting a yeah, pee bottle left and right. And it was disgusting. It's real. Yeah. Treat them like people, right? Give them a place to use the restroom. Give them a place to eat. Get out of the shade, out of the elements. Like this stuff is basics like fundamentals of human living go back to your dog if you scream at them like a dog they're gonna pee on your porch (laughs) yep yeah that's a great that's a great analogy you were just saying made me think of i saw i was in a pool meeting and it was in the dc area large-scale data center project and i had the gc like i was there coaching the team on how to do a pool meeting and the gc was just like you said going after the trade partner like they were a problem and finally, he, he looked at me and he started getting on to me about it. And I looked at that dude and I was like, listen, don't GC me, bro. And I'll be danged if the entire trade partner and owner team started cracking up. But the GC didn't find that very funny. And that happened to be who I was working for <laughs> at the time. But that moment has stuck in my head. And I like, you just described it perfectly. It's like when the attack is on, I hope every trade partner out there that's listening to this, use this, don't GC me, bro, because it is a verb. It is, there is this way of like attack and like unhealthy conflict in order to get what you want and get it done regardless. Have you ever been in a don't GC me, bro moment? 
I was, when I was on the sub side, I was probably never brave enough to say it, but yes, I've been there plenty of times. I was on a project where I was a project manager on the subcontractor side and half my job was writing letters back and forth. It's just, let's work this out. But the GC, they write you a formal letter because of something where you have to respond and they have to respond. And next thing you're just, you're shooting letters back and forth. And it was a project that was out of our state. So like I would go visit, I wasn't there full time. I'd go visit every couple of weeks and you'd show up and you've been writing this keyboard battle with this other opposing project manager. So you show up and there's no collaboration. I want to go in this trailer and see the guy. It was just, it was a very bad experience for everybody involved, but for whatever reason, he felt like that's how he had to manage his projects was by writing formal e not even emails, like formal letters. <laughs> it was just a mess. Yeah. So I love, I've seen the theme, right? I asked you like, Hey, when was a point of failure? And you mentioned your writing of emails and demands. I am so happy to see that you have channeled that writing into something like crazy useful. Is that, is writing a passion of yours or what are you passionate? I never would have said I was passionate about writing. Like I didn't a year and a half ago, two years ago, I was literally, I was on like dairy and I see people like copywriting. What the hell is this? I had to go Google it. But I wouldn't say, I feel like I've always been a, a good communicator through writing. Like I can generally write emails that are bullet pointed. Like I'm never going to write a, a novel. Like I'm not creative. I'm not describing a beautiful yeah, landscape for this kind of crap. But like I'm fairly to the point, which like something like LinkedIn suits me well, because nobody wants to read a novel <laughs> and like the newsletter as well, short to the point, casual. I try to keep it humorous. Like I'll inject like memes and gifts and that sort of stuff into it because this whole industry People like to have fun. They like to joke. It can be very stressful and painful. So it's like you go to any job site and like people are joking around, ha trying to have a good time. It's like one of those things, if you don't laugh, you cry. It's my passion is probably, I don't know if it's necessarily the writing, but it's definitely trying to help the next generation coming up. It's definitely trying to help quote the little guys. There's a, a whole lot of resources out there for the big general contractors. Like everybody's trying to help the big general contractors and all the sorts, maybe because they have all the money. And they have all the money to spend, but there's just not a lot of good resources for the little guys in the industry, now, whether it be the subcontractors or the smaller general contractors or those sort of stuff. That's probably one of my passions is trying to get back to them. I like it. You've mentioned that you've seen the construction industry from a few different lenses. Like one, a trade partner lens or a subcontractor or a specialty trade contractor. And that's how I love to refer to them. Mm -hmm. A general contractor and also now an owner's rep. And so the softball question is clearly like, how, how did you look at the work different at each role? So we'll just start with that one and see where we go. So I've actually never been on the general contractor side, but I've seen it from both angles. I saw them from the, you know, subcontractor side, looking up contractually and from the owner's rep side, looking down contractually, right? So I've seen both sides of that thing. But when I was on the subcontractor side, you're obviously, you got your blinders on. You've got a task, you've got a scope, you've got, granted, you, you are a piece of the overall puzzle, but if I'm on a, if I'm looking for a plumber, for instance, I don't necessarily care about what the electrician's doing, as long as he's not in the way. I don't Unless really. my urinals need power. Yeah. Exactly. Or yeah. he ran his conduit right where my cast iron's going. <laughs> and he missed the big picture sometimes because you're worried about your budget, you're worried about your material, you're worried about your schedule, you're worried about your, it's almost self-serving almost, but it has to be. But you're locally optimized, right? Exactly. So when I came to the owner's rep side, you're seeing stuff more holistically. You're seeing how all the pieces come together. You probably see that on the general contractor side, but again, I skipped that step in the thing. But even then, the general contractor, I think sometimes they miss the big picture because they're still worried about schedule and this and that and make sure they're, they're seeing all the trades, making sure that they're all where they need to be and that sort of stuff. But a lot of times they may even miss why we're building this, what the end goal is. You know, we're building this thing for this owner that was going to do something. So the decisions they make and the way they're looking at it may not be the best for the end user, for the owner. And it may not even be necessarily that they're doing it out of spite or they're doing it subjected on budget. They're just missing the bigger picture. And so I was talking to somebody the other day and I was like, man, like I have such a bigger understanding of how all the pieces flow now, just from this perspective of that. I was like, if I were ever to go back like to the subcontractor side and see stuff through that. I feel like it'd be way more effective and beneficial to the team because I can see how, what we do here plays off to the big thing, even like a change order. If you're on the subcontractor side, if you're writing a change order, you're thinking like, okay, I have to give this to the general contractor. I have to sell the general contractor. I have to like, make him understand. 
the general contractor then takes it, packages them all up, gives them to the owner. And so if you understand that full process and understand how the whole thing works and that owner isn't in the weeds with you, he doesn't, under, he or she doesn't really understand what's happening in the field you know, to that granular degree. So that if you can write your change order in a way that tells the story, paints the picture, one that they, they second guess it a lot less, right? Because they're understanding, okay, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. This is justifying your costs a little bit so that you don't get tied up in that whole battle of like, why is this going to take a hundred hours? Let's 10 hours for this, 10 hours for this, 10 hours for this, before you know it, like it adds up fast. I don't know if that answered the question. I went on a tangent, but I've just, I've been able to see the whole industry from more of a holistic view, which I think everyone should be able to do in some way. Yeah, I think you answered the question and then answered the next question that I didn't even ask yet because you went and you gave me an example, right? Like you, the change order example is a beautiful thing because when I'm a sub, a sub or a specialty trade and I'm looking at the change order, it's like, how am I going to get my money from the GC? Not thinking that the GC turns around and does the same thing. So you're taking it from, from this uh, siloed thinking of, hey, I'm only worried about my trade to this thinking in systems of, I mean, I'm worried about all of the trades because without one, I can't do my work. And yeah, and I think that was brilliantly said. It can uh, make the general contractor's life easier at the end of the day. He's going to want to bring you on to the next project. If you make the owner's life easier, they're going to want to tell the general contractor, you'll hire that guy. I want him on the team, especially it's more negotiated work projects. Yeah. And that's what we're looking for, right? When we actually talk about collaboration and say, hey, we're all here to serve a user. Oh, by the way, we probably have never met the user. Maybe only the, maybe the owner's rep has met, maybe you've met the user and maybe not. And so I think that's important to think about. Like we're building a building for someone that we have never met. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty typical in construction. I, that's, it's an interesting thing that we're stumbling across. I wonder how much more passionate our people would be building if they met the people that are going to be using the building, because then it, it's hard to cut a corner when you look somebody in the eye and say, yeah, I'm going to make your office look perfect, beautiful, paint it. And then you go out there in the field and you don't, that's tough. Yeah. Being able to tie the purpose behind it all. We launched our podcast. Angelo Suntrees was our first guest and he wrote the human side of construction. And it was a, sorry, Angelo, I still haven't read the book. He sent me a copy of it. And I, it, anyway, I've thumbed through it, but. I've got to know him very well over the last couple of years. So I know where he's coming from, but that was the point he made was like, you're building this thing. He was talking about building a hospital and you're still, again, got your blinders on, get the problems of the day. You got this, that all you gotta do, you gotta get this thing installed. You got the thing installed, you're late, your budget, this thing didn't show up on time. You got this problem. And I think he said it was like, they just wrapped up maybe his substantial completion or you hit a milestone. And he said it was, a, it was late in the day, a long day. One of those, the sun's probably already set. He's walking back to his truck and it's off and look and holy crap, man. Of a hospital, like people are gonna be born in this thing. People are gonna be like lives are saved in this thing. People like people are gonna die in this thing. This thing is gonna be such an integral part of the community, and we built it. And just being able to tie your purpose of running your cast iron pipe that's in your fight with the electrician. Like when you take step back and look at like the bigger picture of what you're actually doing and how it's impacting the community, impacting like the lives of the city or wherever you're at. It's like hard to cut the corners or to not have a bigger purpose of what you're doing. Yeah. I thought you were going to tell me he, he dropped down to his knees and had a medical emergency and then they rushed him to a bed that he had just built or something. <laughs> That's where my head is because ultimately the users of that healthcare facility could be the people who are building the facility. You might be building your own room. hundred percent. But you definitely will take a shirt in. Yeah. Or like you're building a school and your kids are going to go to the school. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited about that book. I'm going to have to track that down and probably Angela too, because we are putting together a course for Clemson right now titled the human side of constructions. I would absolutely be thrilled to get him involved with that effort as we take and craft that course. No, I really agree. Why? Yeah, definitely. I follow him on TikTok, I believe. He's all over. And he's on Instagram. He's he really blown up on Instagram. He got banned off As LinkedIn. He got, he's coming back on LinkedIn, but he got booted for... How do you <laughs> get banned on LinkedIn? And I didn't even know that was a thing. They said he was automating connection requests or something like that, but he it wasn't. But LinkedIn was uh, funny. I got put in time out once for sending too many messages. They thought I had a, uh, I was a robot. And that was... Interesting. interesting. Basically, people were connecting with me and I was just saying, hey, I don't, thanks for connecting. Glad to meet you. And 
I said that too many times. They thought I was a robot and I got put a timeout. So the construction, yeah, you robot. It'd be nice if it was. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So let's do this. Let's take a couple minutes and shout out some people who have made like a serious difference in your career. Who are those two or three, maybe four people that have impacted Matt's career the most? A few different, I call them mentors along the way. Each stop I've had. A lot of it, again, like I haven't had, I can't say every company I went to, I've had one person that I'm like, man, this person saved her. I don't know. I, I really like to just put pieces together. I'll definitely say though, like in the last couple of years of starting all this construction Yeti stuff and getting involved on LinkedIn and getting and posting, those have probably been the people who probably changed the trajectory of my career probably the most. People like Jesse Hernandez. Yeah. I've talked to Jesse like probably every few weeks and he's always pushing me to do the next thing, do the next thing. And I'm like, man, I can't be you. I can't live stream every day and <laughs> write a book every month and do all these sort of things. So just his, when he was on our podcast, he was saying he had the quote like, to do the damn thing. And that's how I did. So people like him, people like you, I don't believe an awful hundred people on there, but just the people I've connected through and oh okay, man, like if you guys can do this, like I can do it too. Just open my mind to kind of bigger things. Absolutely. I think that's important the whole. You are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. That is a real thing. And you have the ability to change that at any point in your career and your life by just changing the people, right? Do different things. If you'd have told me three years ago that one, I'd be writing a weekly newsletter, it goes out on emails, two, be doing a podcast, three, meeting all these people and being all these podcasts and just like connecting with people all over the country, all over the world. Heck, I had a call the other night with a guy from Abu Dhabi. Like he's a construction tech founder. Like how would I ever meet somebody from Houston, Texas, on the half, literally on the other side of the world, if it wasn't through the internet, LinkedIn, and <clears throat> content creation. And we had a really great conversation and like shared notes. And I was like, man, like what's happening here is like the same crap that's happening there. You know what I mean? And it's just, you're definitely, when you put yourself out there and be vulnerable, and do that sort of thing. It's, you can just meet so many people and you find other people that are in that same circle too, that are really trying to do big things to change the industry. Absolutely. Get outside your comfort zone, people. Fight through that fear zone. Get into the learning and growth zone. That's where that. 100%. So we have teased this newsletter and podcast too much. You're still doing the podcast, yeah? Yes. I say that you're. <laughs> that was a weird yes. <laughs> we, so we ran it from. February of last year through basically Thanksgiving. And then, so Kyle Grandel, I met him through all this stuff. We kept, we had a few phone calls together and we were thinking like, man, we need to do something together. And after we talked for a few times, I was like, we can do a podcast. We had no clue what we were doing, but again, I went on Google and figured it out and here we are. We ran it from February through Thanksgiving ish. And then with the holidays happening and he was on a project that was just like sucking the life out of him. Put it on pause through the holidays. And we're like, we're going to pick it back up after the new year. About every three or four days, we text each other like, when are we going to start? <laughs> and then he texted me like yesterday, like, dude, we suck. Like we're going to relaunch it. But yeah, it was a weird, it was like, when you pause for that long, it's just like hard to like, hope we pick this back up. I really enjoyed this. I really liked it. It's really giving back to people. People enjoy it. But yeah, we just got to pick a date and get it launched again. But yeah, it, and I love it, man. It's called CM Mentors and that's what you're doing. Like you're bringing mentors on the show for people to understand like, Hey, how is the life in construction? Like, mm -hmm. how can I prepare for this life in construction? And I think it's genius and beautiful. And I've got probably a dozen people that I would love to recommend that you go and talk to more so like old school, old dog superintendents, if you know what I'm saying. Oh yeah. So I would love to send that uh, your way. And maybe I might even just start challenging you in all these public forums that you're at. I need my see a mentor podcast. Where is it? Let's go, baby. No, we're going to, we're going to launch it again. Just do the damn thing. Just do the damn thing. Just got to get it on the counter. That's what I told, that's what I told Kyle. I was like, we just got to pick a date and do the damn thing. Cause we keep yeah. saying like, all right, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. Hell, I've got a list of, I've just been like, as I've been meeting people, they'd be a good guess. I've got a running list of finished people nice. that I want to get in quote season two, but I'm definitely looking for more people. Yeah, so we got a lot of listeners. Where can they go find the CM, CM event first podcast? It's on all the podcast apps, Apple, Spotify, the, the video goes on YouTube also at constructionyeti.substack.com. That's where the newsletter lives. That's where the podcast is hosted. So the whole podcast archives there, you can listen to it there. And also the YouTube videos there, you can subscribe to the, the newsletter there and also send out every time we do a new podcast, I'll send you out a, just a little email. Like, hey, this one, 
So boots and boots dropped. Go listen to it. Yeah. So it's all there at constructionyeti.substack.com. But if you just like the audio, Apple, Spotify, all those places. Yeah, I am on there. That was a good time. I very much enjoyed it. Despite the surprise live version, I still enjoyed it. We had a really good time. It was a good time. And that's what we're looking to do in this next, the next season two is we want to do more live events. It's hard to do during the day. We were doing it in the afternoon, but trying to coordinate schedules. We want people on that are actually doing the damn thing. They actually have a job. So it's hard to get those people. So we're looking at doing some of the evenings, maybe every other week doing an evening and then every alternating weeks, just doing a pre-recorded one that goes out. But trying to do them on LinkedIn Live, YouTube Live, and actually wanting to get build more of a community around it and the audience to ask questions, be a part of the conversation. If we're having a conversation and people have a specific question that we're not thinking about, we're trying to bring in industry experts and like stuff that we don't know. I don't know everything. There's a million things in this industry I don't know, which I'm, I feel like if I'm learning something, hopefully the audience is learning something through the thing. Again, if I'm not asking the right question, I want somebody in the audience to be able to ask it to right. Yeah. So I've been brainstorming my next question as you were talking. I hope you don't mind. And we're going to turn it up a little bit because I've been pretty nice to you so far, man. I want to know something about you that not many people know. I'd say, I don't know. It depends on how closely we, but like I have, one thing we share is we both have twins, which is probably giving me way more gray hair for my age than I probably ever should have. Uh, Yours are boys, have, right? Mine are girls. Yeah. Boys. You have holes in every wall. Not yet. They're not, they're six years old. They're trying. They're not quite strong enough, but we will in a few years. I'm sure of it. I have twins. I played rugby all through college in, in the men's club. We won the national championship in 2017. Hey. That's the club I was playing for. <laughs> Do you know scrum very well, huh? I, I know the true scrum very well. Ooh, Felipe is going to be mad at you. <laughs> I'm picking fights with people like Felipe. What else? Probably the biggest one is people think... <laughs> Think that like when I started all this thing, that like, oh man, it just came so easy. Probably if you didn't go back and read my very early content, especially like newsletter number one, when I started the newsletter, I was scared shitless. I was terrified. Honestly, like when I put out the, the LinkedIn post, and I didn't really have any followers. It was like people, it was literally people I worked with for the last 10 years before that or whatever it was. I put out this LinkedIn post. I was like, hey, I'm gonna go start this weekly newsletter. This is what it's gonna be about. Go subscribe if you want. That was like one of the most terrifying moments in my life of just like, what are people going to think? Like, why am I doing this? People are going to think I'm crazy. They're going to judge me. They're going to like, who am I? What, why does anybody care what I have to say? But you had, you were talking about that. You got to get out of your comfort zone into the growth zone. And that was actually literally that chart or that kind of that circle diagram before everybody's seen. Yep. I put that in newsletter number one, cause I was like, I'm terrified. Like I'm doing this, but I'm scared. And, but I'm trying to get out of my comfort zone into these growth zones to actually and it's worked. Like I've grown so much over the last couple of years, but just that I was on a call with people at work that were trying to implement some like LinkedIn strategies with they're trying to help people share their voice on LinkedIn as an initiative that we're doing. And that was something I could tell people, I don't even know where to start, what, why, and, but everybody sees I've been doing this for two years. And so I'll, I'll write something on LinkedIn and I don't care anymore. <laughs> I'm, not, yeah. I'm not scared anymore. Podcasts, like the first podcast I did. I was like sitting here and I've been on zoom calls a million times and it's super casual. It's super conversational until that red recording light comes on and everyone like buttons yeah. up, suits up, like stiffens up. But anyway, it's just, you push through that and then it becomes more kind of doing anything. The first time you do it, you're scared and you're terrified. You don't know what you're doing. And then you just get more comfortable with it. Yeah. The old roller coaster effect. Let's say this. Oh, I'm terrified. Ooh, that was fun. Let's do it. <laughs> so what are your today roller coasters? Like, how are you still living that principle of, I want to get outside my comfort zone because I know there's a growth there. What does that look like in today's instruction yet? So uh, I was getting to a groove, right? I was writing weekly newsletters. Just like I don't like my musings. This is what I'm just thinking about doing. I'm wanting to highlight more people which bringing them on, highlight more people. I'm really wanting to turn this into a, like a, in my mind, snap my fingers and all the pieces are in place, turn it into a full-blown media thing. That's the, that's like the go-to resource for anybody managing construction projects or managing construction companies and having resources for all that. Maybe it's three or four newsletters, maybe it's three or four podcasts, like all around that. And I built out in my mind in 2024, I really want to put a lot of effort into quote, dragging the construction industry into the 21st century. Everyone talks about how it's so far behind the times, whether it's the people side of stuff, like we're still managing putting 1990s porta potties there, right? Let's take all these sort of stuff. 
So we're using a scheduling system that hasn't changed since the fifties. Yes. Sorry. No, that's you plan into it. One is the technology and the tools, right? Let's get up to speed on these sort of things. One is digital marketing and social media. The industry is scared of the internet. And we don't care about your projects. We care about your people. Three is like upskilling and training properly and proper mentorship. And because a lot of times it's like you hire you, you throw you on the project and you'll figure it out. There's, you'll learn from the project manager while you're there. And that's not really the best way to go about things. And then fourth is doing all that in a people first way. So I guess the roller coaster of that is I'm trying to change it a little bit more. I'm trying to morph it, pivot a little bit more, I'm trying to figure out how to make this into a, a business, right? It'd be nice to get some revenue going with it so that we can bring in some actual contributors, like bringing somebody who's a proper podcast editor that can make things better than me, but trying to turn it into more of the business mind set and try to figure out what that looks like. Yeah. Oh, so I got a guy for you on podcast editing, man. Justin's brother, Rene Garon. Yeah. Garon Styles. He's doing all of the rebuilder stuff right now. Super reasonable. Great work. Every week he gives me something and it just gets better and better. Like he's the prime definition of lean. He's continuously improving, et cetera. So I'd love to make that connection for you. But, and however else I can help as well, I, I think you're the way I understand what you just said is you've been tiptoeing into the industry, meeting the industry. And clearly we live in a broken system, right? You don't like some of the things that you're seeing in the industry. And so you're taking it on to change that. Like that's a big deal. And if you're not uncomfortable with that, I don't know what would make you uncomfortable. It, yes. It's, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of people talking about it. There's very few people like yourself and this group of people I found myself in that are actually trying to do something about it. You know what I mean? And that's me talking about who are the people that are like shaped you and it's like that group of people that are really trying to change the industry that I've, i somehow found myself right in the middle of which i'm very thankful for Can but i also, just stop you real fast because i don't think you just found yourself in the midst of these people i'm pretty sure that you earned your way there and that you did the hard work that it took to be associated with these people and quite honestly i'm loving watching you Almost take it to another level. Don't shortchange yourself on the contributions that you have made to be in that circle because you're doing freaking amazing things. I appreciate that, man. I really do. It's, I guess what I meant by that was like, it wasn't the intent of never yeah. intent of being a content creator. I never intended, but you just you start leaning on your passions. You're finding out what you're passionate about and it's that kind of giving back to the little guy and helping out these people that there's just a lot of people trying to do good in this industry that just don't know the stuff they don't know. They're trying hard. They're trying to pay their bills. They're trying to keep cash flow going in their business and they just can't quite get over that hump. They're always trying to chase in the tail and just trying to help those guys. And I'm partnering with a few people on some kind of some ventures that maybe will help them out a little bit more. I always thought like, all this stuff, I want to do it myself. I'm going to do it myself. I just want to do it more myself. And I've realized like, you really got to find good partners and really can lean on. I said a minute ago, that word synergy, I like, almost didn't even like it because I was so burned out on just like, the corporate BS. Synergy, create synergy. Blah, 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 blah. But if you actually look at the definition of it, like it is such a really great word that one plus one can equal three, one plus one can equal seven. You know what I mean? You can really build on strengths. And when I started this whole thing, I had a phone call with Tats Nakagawa, which I'm sure you know Tats. I had a specified growth podcast, right? Oh, man. I didn't do my homework. I didn't really know who he was. I thought he was a woofer <laughs> that had a podcast. And I got on this call and I started talking to him and I'm like, holy crap, this guy's not a roofer. Holy crap, this guy's, this guy's awesome. Like really awesome. I'm not going to say the roofer can't be awesome, but he was telling me a bunch of stuff. And one thing that he told me, and this was like two years ago, it's still stuck in my head, was you've got to find people with complementary skill sets as your own. You know what I mean? Really link hard into your strengths, but find people with the complementary skill sets to, to, so you make a full round of thing. And I, I remember writing, the, I remember it vividly. Like it hit me in my head. I wrote it down in my notebook and I went back to it a lot. And but still, I was still stuck in my head. Of, nah, I'm going to do this all myself. I'm going to do this. Anyway, so I realized like, like finding good partners, the unlock to me. Yeah, I've got a good book for that because I've just got a book for everything. And there's a leaning tower behind you. No, yeah, and it's getting ready to fall. I probably ought to do something about that. 
I bought too many Bobby Miliani books and they're all in there. No, the book is called Who Not How. It's exactly what it sounds. You're the second person who's told me about that book. It's fantastic, man. You will not regret it, but it's everything that you're talking about right now. Finding people who's working genius to use a Patrick Lencioni term is different from yours and can complement yours because you're right. We can't do it all. This is something I'm in the process of learning myself mm -hmm. and yeah. Anyways, so we'll just leave it at that. What else, man? Where else do we want to take this thing? I don't know, man. What can I do to help you out with what you're building? Old dogs, man. Send them our way, bro. Like the old dog community. That's it. What you said, upskilling really piqued my interest because I think there's some synergy. <laughs> there's some synergy there in what we're trying to do with the old dog community mm -hmm. and with getting old dogs on job sites with the next generation eventually. And now we're starting with this bi-monthly talks, discussions where anybody can bring any problem that they're facing in the field to a group of 15 to 20 seasoned superintendents from across the country, different companies, top BNR companies, not top BNR companies, like we've got them all. And so it's really sending people that way. I'd love to explore with you how we can, again, like help utilize the community and, and work together on that. I think it was number three of upscaling. That's no, that's such a cool concept because there's oh, whatever you said, 10 people are going to retire, seven people are going to retire and one person is going to come in the industry. Those seven and 10 people, those aren't young people. Those are guys with guys and girls with years and decades of experience and know-how and been able to capture that knowledge and pass it on. I think a lot of these folks, like they're going to find that they want to retire. They want to get off the tools. They want to get out of the day-to-day -day headache of running the projects. But they don't want to go live on the beach. They don't want to go fishing. They they still need a purpose. And so being able to rechannel that through something is. Yeah. In fact, I'm worried without that purpose, some of them will die, to be quite honest with you. And so I'm brainstorming ways on how we can turn them into consultants to do what I do and mm -hmm. send them to a job, say, hey, you want to work six days a month or two days a month? Great. Let's try and filter out the right job site for you and the conditions and there you go. Here's an old dog to answer the knowledge gap that exists in your company. Because that's real. Like you just said, like that knowledge gap, those nine people that are leaving are taking a ton of knowledge with them. And that one person coming in is looking at an industry that is in shambles saying, how do I operate? And boy, would it be nice to take that 30 years of experience and just hand it to that person and allow them to hit the industry right in. So hand it to them, be there for them as they have problems, questions. It's you, you learn something new every day. And if you don't have somebody to call on to help you, that's, I was trying to build that sort of thing. I'm not an old dog by any means. There's a lot more stuff I don't know than I do know, but trying to like be a resource for it. So if you can really bottle that up, man, it's going to really change the next decade. Yeah. And for the record, I would classify you as an old dog, right? Because you're a builder. You care about people. You clearly want to make the industry a better place and you're not running around writing emails, threatening contracts. You've got a new not anymore. Yeah. So I would absolutely classify you as an old dog. Again, it's not just old people. It's not just people that are, are getting ready to retire. It's that way of thinking that we just want to make the industry a better place because right now, honestly, it sucks. We're getting better. I will end with that. We are getting better slowly, but surely we're definitely seeing it. It is. It's the next generation is coming up. Uh, there's going to be a huge culture shift, I believe, as some of those old, there's the old, you, get, you call them old dogs, right? They, there's a good side of the old dog, but there's also a bad side of the old dog. There's a bad side of the industry that's also leaving the way that it used to be done. Those guys are handing over their companies to their sons or their daughters or their whatever, or selling it or doing whatever. And then when the millennial generation is coming up and then Gen, Gen Z is coming up after that, they look at, I think, the industry in a different lens, different mindset, different place. And they want it. They're seeing stuff that they want to implement, want to do. But some of the old dogs, the bad side of the old dogs are still running. <laughs> They're still in charge. And I, I think we're gonna, we're seeing a huge culture shift in things right now, which is, makes it super exciting. Yeah. For the record, I just call those people old. They're not <laughs> dogs. <laughs> now I'm going to get canceled, but that's okay. <laughs> We, but you're right. You're dead if, on. If they listen, no one, none of those old people are listening to an hour long with podcasts. They can't even find this podcast. They don't care, man. Good night. Take us out, man. What is your message to the world? What are we going to do to change what we're talking about? What do you want to tell the people? Man, you put me on the big screen. 
I would just say, just keep doing what we're all trying to do to change the industry. Keep trying to drag the industry in the 21st century, make it people first, use the technology, use the tools to really make the work better for those people and, and out there t- swinging the hammers, turning the wrenches, like laying the pipe. Don't use the technology to, to suck every last drop of productivity out of the industry. And let's just keep all collaborating, working together to make this place a better place. That's what lean builders do, baby. Thank you, man. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Adam. It's always fun to talk.